Awesome. So we are actually live. And this system is crazy because every time I click it, it's been live for six seconds. We've just been staring at each other, waiting for me to tell you guys that it was live. But we are. And this is episode 21. I have Alex and Casey. And I put in the Facebook post and the YouTube post that um, you guys wrote the article in Reptiles Magazine uh, about sail fins. And I was super stoked because... I am one of the people that grew up as a kid reading reptiles and then you got to do the thing I thought was super cool and get published in it. And I know as you know, forums became a thing and then magazines slid a little bit and then Facebook became a thing and it seems like forums and magazines slid a little bit and maybe not as many people keep up with reptiles, but I'm a grown man who still gets reptiles. I'm like it's not just a kid magazine. So I for sure uh, have that issue. And it was really awesome to see, I, I was just telling you guys before we went live, like I saw those names and was like, I know who those people are. That That's really cool. So congratulations on that. I'm very excited for both of you. Um, so yeah, I wanted to have you on to kind of talk about the article and sail fins in general, and then just be lizard nerds. Cause I know you both are lizard nerds. So uh, yeah, take us through it. What, how did you get an article in reptiles and your, names are on every like that's super cool what happened how did it happen uh, uh, I, mean, um, I guess yeah Casey you reached out to me I want to say it was like December last year uh, and you've Casey I don't know if you guys don't know Casey has already written an article on keeping hydrosaurus in captivity for her pediculture magazine but yes. she reached out to me saying hey nobody likes there was the her pediculture magazine yeah. we don't talk about that here. <laughs> No, but I'm, uh, uh, what uh, I was going to say, um, she was like, you know, Hydrosaurus was reclassified March 2020. There were three species that were divided now into five. And she had a lot of background knowledge. I had a lot of background knowledge. And she was like, listen, we both know a lot. What if we combined Hydrosaurus nerd knowledge and wrote an article for Reptiles Magazine? You know, the, the big one. And uh, from there, it was pretty much a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, uh, a lot of Zoom meetings, probably Zoom meetings, especially during my finals times that I could have spent studying, but you know, Hydrosaurus first. And um, from there, we started reaching out to people. Uh, one of the biggest things, especially for me, uh, regarding Hydrosaurus is the confusion among the species. You're talking about a lizard that people will, I don't know, I guess, on especially the Indonesian forums, they're always like, what do I have? What do I have? What do I have? And one of the things that Casey told me is we want to avoid that. You know, a lot of pictures, more visual learning. You know, you can read something 20 times and no matter how well you describe it, it, it doesn't click until you actually see it in the flesh. Whereas, you know, Casey was like, okay, what if we put a photo of the Northern and Southern phenotype Hydrosaurus microlophus? Because now you know what it looks like. You know the head structure. You know how the dorsal scales look compared to the northern phenotype versus the southern phenotype. And then apply that to all five of the hydrosaurus species, be it your Webers from the North Maluccas, or again, uh, what we now know as Ambonensis, or the true Maluccan sailfin dragon from Surim and Ambon. And then, of course, the two Sulawesi species, which were the recently described ones. Yeah, I think it's like one thing to keep a really, I mean, I guess you could call them rare in the hobby. It's one thing to keep them and breed them, but I think it's another thing to share information about them. And like Alex said, I have people reaching out to me from Indonesia, where they're from, asking me to identify the species. So when I'm hearing people... The internet is so weird. Korea, like something's wrong. <laughs> we need, we know enough that I think together, Alex and I, we, you know, we talked, we said, I, I think that we can put something together that's going to be helpful from every, anyone who is just interested in the species, interested in purchasing their first one um, to somebody that might have five and not know what they have, which is the case a lot of the time. Um, and like Alex said, you know, sometimes it's hard to get through a bit of a, you know, I don't even know if you would call it a scientific article, but it can be wordy. Um, and sometimes visuals help a lot. Um, and we have a lot of people 
that even reach out to me that don't speak English half the time. So visuals are helpful and, and sometimes just kind of translating what we're saying back and forth. Um, like, I can, I can see you're trying to tell me celebensis. Here's a picture. <laughs> so that was that look wasn't for you. The, the chat's going weird on me. Um, so I, I know Alex from our Madison Herp nerd connections and so forth. And, and I know how he became a lizard nerd. Uh, how is it? How do you end up being the person that someone from Indonesia be through the ether of the internet figures out it's you and you you are the person to ask how did you end up being that person well alex can has his own story because he runs a lot of you, you do run the facebook group right the the one that got closed down or you did or you were an admin on it i know you had a lot to do with um the facebook groups where people from all across the world were sharing information and pictures but for me it was just there, the celebensis is very rare to see in the United States. And I think that just by posting a few pictures on my social media drew those people to me saying, oh, I see you have one. What is okay. mine? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that is kind of the thing where we were talking a little bit before we went live, like, it's it it feels underrated but also like a bucket list like for me uh one of the local zoos here in illinois had one and i, I thought it was the coolest thing ever and i knew exactly what it was i was super stoked you know i went and talked to the curator uh, very excited and then you had a handful of other nerds come through and all super stoked and then the vast majority of people had no idea, right? And then you go to the major shows and you see a couple and they always draw a crowd. Like everybody's super excited. And then they just fade away, mm -hmm. you know? And it, yeah, I mean, it, it would, especially through the way social media works, like it would draw a pretty major spotlight to you, you know, just because if it's going to draw that kind of a crowd at a national level, reptile show you know the algorithms of instagram anybody who's searching that you know you're you're going to be it for quite a long time um i mean how do you that's weird right like is that weird like when you have people from indonesia hitting you up you <laughs> know like that's kind yeah. of an odd conversation it, it's really interesting at the same time i mean and, and I reach out to people and Alex does as well. Like I'll contact people for that exact reason that I know are from, let's say Indonesia and they're posting pictures of celebensis and microlophus. I'll reach out to them and ask questions. And I know Alex does the same thing. So it's kind of a two way street here, but I think we're all learning. Like it's one species that no matter where you are, no matter what you're keeping, like we are all learning. And like Alex said, it was just a year ago that we have this update on the taxonomy. So um, the world is still learning about that. Figuring it out. <laughs> which is why I think both Alex and I are so interested in them and so um, interested in writing the article is because it's it's always evolving. It's exciting. We're, we're not ahead of it, but there's not a lot of people talking about it, which makes it really right. intriguing for us. Yeah. It's, I mean, my understanding of the lizard scene in her pediculture is it's a very small crowd. Uh, and it is, it is changing, you, you know, and on the academic side, literature and things like that are, are changing how things are going. And then it's, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a weird, instance right so like it happened with green trees and a, the the paper came out and green tree pythons and there were divisions of species and so on and so forth and it was this humongous thing because so many people keep them right and then a, a very similar thing happens with sail fins and i doubt anybody really knew until that picture was on the cover of reptiles magazine with your names like it's it is a very similar situation, but the keeper keeper 
population is so small that her pediculture at large, we don't hear about that because, you know, good or bad with the green tree thing, if people liked it or they didn't, if, if you were a nerd on Facebook, you heard about it because there's just a ton of them. Right. And I, I did not know the information about sail fins until I saw that article. And I am a reptile nerd and a lizard nerd specifically. And it's just a super small group of people that are, I don't know, I guess dedicated to it. It Because of that species, I just don't feel like your average pet keeper probably stumbles across them very often. Or how do you, do you see that? Like, is it the people that are keeping them are serious, serious keepers of reptiles like that kind of makes up a larger chunk of their collections or do you see people that kind of one off them what do you what do you see for that group of animals i i guess um you can offend people i see your faces just offend them it's fine <laughs> okay so again like what i was saying earlier about trophy animals uh you get a lot of the, the pet people and i'm not trying to use pet owner as a derogatory term like it you know pet people make up 90% of her pediculture, like including myself, like I've got corn snakes. I'm not even a snake breeder. I just love corn snakes. Right. But what happens is, is you run into say more of like a social media star and they get say a sale fin dragon. Right. And often what I have seen at least, and I'm sure Casey can attest to this too, is that because of their following base and because of, Oh, I've had, bearded dragons that's an agamid so i must know everything about sail fins and then somebody winds up getting a sail fin which they said was captive bred from the breeder underground reptiles <laughs> and then um uh it grows up because it was supposed to be an indo giant and they end up getting a ternate uh halma or ternate slash halmahera weber's sail fin and it's just you know unfortunately it's one of those where obviously education is important i'm not trying to bash anybody like that but at the same time, you know, had they just read a paper, they would have known based on that species infralabial and superlabial scale count that underground reptiles, one, did not sell them a captive bred sailfin. And what they sold as an Indo giant was, in fact, a Weber sailfin, which is two drastically different species since one's from Sulawesi and the other one is literally found five degrees north of the equator on Halmahera. And uh, then, you know, what happens is they've I, got 10,000. I'm just dollars. surprised people don't get it from the price tag, but that's just me. That's, like, that's, every, every, yeah. Everybody always thinks they got the one super awesome sale. Like, no, no, I got the deal. Like, no. Yeah. That is the number, anyone that's listening to this, the number one way to tell you don't have one from Solwazy, meaning an uh, Indo giant, as you would say, is if it's $150. So we'll just put that out there. Uh, unless you get extremely lucky, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, pretty much if it's for sale at a pet store, it's going to be a Halmahera Weber sale fin. Maybe sure. you get lucky and you get one from Sareem or Ambon, which is the Ambonensis self. And now that gets stuck up in that import, uh, just from talking with people in Jakarta, Indonesia, they're all collected from the islands. They're all shipped to Jakarta. So you get a mixed bag and pretty much if, you know, again, Bill, you know how importers work, whoever gets there first to handpick stuff, yeah, handpick all the celebensis. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, you're, you're not going to see a celebensis or a Michaelophis. Whoever in a had the store. VIP yeah. ticket. Exactly. Yeah, buddy. They do come through. I did see a Michaelophis sailfin uh, this spring, actually, at a uh, Show Me Snakes Expo. And that was at Dan Thomas wow. of Animal House's table. Okay. Uh, and I was thoroughly impressed. But then again, it's Dan Thomas. So yeah, of you're course talking about somebody gonna... that has the foreknowledge. Yeah, exactly. And again, though, more on reading, he had it labeled as Ambonensis. Because he figured that one had bigger scales compared to the other one, so he labeled them as a pair at the time. I was like, buddy, that's Celebensis and that's Microlophus, which I thought was still freaking cool. He relabeled them, and, right. I, and then, you know, I sat with him after the show for about half an hour, like, showing him how to count the scales on the lips, the superlabials yeah. and the infralabials and the pore count, the 
digits on the toes. And he was like, that's crazy. I never would have guessed. But it's little things like that, uh, which just go into determining whether or not you've got a sailfin that's going to get four foot or whether you've got one that's only going to stay about two and a half, three feet. Well, um, I think the especially when they all thing. come tiny out of a bucket mm -hmm. off an airplane. <laughs> In Indonesia. <laughs> The other important thing that I feel like we talked about when we were going to write this article is the fact that when you don't know what species you have and then you breed them, we're creating actually, a lot of hybrids and trivrids, which yeah, that just popped in the chat was, is that yeah, common? Extremely common. I okay. feel like, I mean, and I've produced trivrids and hybrids. I'm not knocking them, but I think for the sake of our species are, the ones we have in the United States, it would be great for people to become more educated and to breed straight celibensis, pure microlophus. Sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think they have two of the same. Then they breed them, then they now all of a sudden have a, a hybrid, then they sell the hybrid as let's say a pure pustulatus, and here we go down this long line, and now we don't know what we have anymore. And right. so, Hopefully educating people, being able to determine species will help selectively choose which ones we're breeding and selling the babies as, I mean, you get where I'm going with yeah. this, but yeah. I think that's like a huge problem right now. Kind of a truth in advertising kind of thing. Yeah. So having bred them now, when you're talking about um, scale counts and different things with crosses does that start to get muddled or and and so that's where we get lost in the mix right is because we're looking for certain scale counts then these babies come out and it's a mishmash and and now we're lost in the sauce exactly um i mean the best representation is i flew down to visit scott corning this summer who's well respected the, i mean he's pretty much the founder of the cell phone community and he actually originated the Ujung Philippang hybrid, uh, which is when, you know, way before science even recognized Microlophus, he lost a group of Microlophus with only one female remaining. And to preserve her bloodlines, he then bred her to a Pustulatus. Um, okay. And because of that, though, when I got to see, you know, these 15, 17 year old dragons in person, I'm counting the scales. And you can see, you know, Pustulatus generally uh, on the toe fringes, I want to say it's around like 32. And then the microlophus have as many as 44. They're just so much more larger. And yet these hybrids, when I counted, I most notably, um, I think one of them had like 38 and the other had 39. So, so it's, it's a just a straight yeah. up mix. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it varies from individual to individual too. You can see the, the microlophus traits and that hybrid line specifically are much more dominant. Um, Casey actually has a gorgeous representation of that hybrid, uh, your boy Damien. And I mean, he's just, they're huge. I mean, these are sailfins that are always over 40 inches uh, and they, they keep the purple sheen of the pustulatus, but you get a lot of the larger dorsal scales, the higher infralabial and superlabial scale count. And they just, the massive nose crest, they're gorgeous animals. But again, to somebody that doesn't understand how to identify that that's the hybrid line and not a pure microlophus, when somebody right. does get pure microlophus in the States, which as far as I'm concerned, concern just started this year you know it's like what happens if you outcross that and then you completely ruin the pool and right. that's when the worry happens in a sense hydrosaurs people are just going to have to become more alias snobs where your your microlophus is 87.5 percent you know just like a jungle jag or however right. the carpet python people are <laughs> well so because this kind of going off what the chat was saying of Is that a worry? So the re my understanding of it is the reason that Morelia snobs are Morelia snobs is because they can't get anymore. And so they get really hemmed up about percentages and bloodlines and so on and so forth because they're extremely limited with the stock of their animals. So I kind of get it. It's kind of going off the chat with availability. Now, is that something where that will probably be or is currently a concern or are we kind of limited in the number of animals we have like i know chunks come in importer you know kind of by the bucket for some species um is that something where they're all more or less available or are we kind of cutting it slim on some of these species to where we need to be very concerned about 
aside from the ethical portion, but just availability wise, concerned about keeping things pure. Do, do you guys know as far as her pediculture availability, I guess? Um, I mean, Casey, unless you want to make, I'd say of the five species now, we cannot get in. Uh, well, we can get in four of them. We can't get in Pustolatus. The Philippines stopped exporting Hydrosaurus Pustolatus, I believe, in the early 90s. And so the reason for that was because they were literally being sold for the pet trade. The locals eat them as a delicacy, and they were marked down from least concern to a vulnerable species by ICUN. And so because of that, or IUCN, whatever the acronym is, and so because of that, all Pustolatus you see in the States are captive bred. The issue is there's not a lot of people that could breed them. And even worse, of the people that could breed them, there's very poor track records of those lineages. So okay. somebody selling a Philippine self and dragon, well, was it from John Steele's line? Was it from Linda Switzer's? Is it from Ty Parks? Or is it Scott Corning's? And then that's the ultimate guessing game. Generally, um, you know, some of the hardcore people are pretty good about it. Uh, it's like, I mean, Casey right here, she's got a stunning group of pustulatus that she got from John Steele. And so John Steele doesn't breed them anymore. So at least for me, who's a nerd about who's got what, the genetic significance of Casey's trio, right? We're talking one male and two females, even though there's other people working with Philippine Sailfin Dragons. That trio is genetically diverse compared to Ty Park, Linda Switzer, and Scott Corning. Meaning okay. there is so much, you know, potential like that. It's the little right. things like that. And I mean, as far as I know, between UKC, I mean, my one friend Kristen and my one friend Ryan, those are the only people with John Steele Pustolatus left in the United States. Yeah. Which and is scary. Availability is different than breeding pairs, if that makes sense. So there yeah, might absolutely. be a lot or a handful of, let's say, Microlophus, which I'd go ahead and say is the rarest by far in the United States, followed by Celebensis. There might be a bunch here that I'm unaware of. Um, the problem is not a lot of people have a pair. And if they do have a pair, they're unable to breed them. So okay. it's more... We, we do, like Alex said, get a lot of imports in. So I, I think that we will be able, if we get them into the right hands, be able to produce more and then, you know, have more in this country. But right now, I think it's just a matter of getting them into the right hands because we might have a lot. That just doesn't mean that people are doing anything with them. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Another one of those species that if the faucet turns off from overseas, they're just going to fade away. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. With that being said, though, I think we, I confidently can say that right now there are people in this country who have breeding pairs of every single species. So it's not like, awesome. like to my knowledge, there's, it, you know, a couple people that have Celebensis pairs, a handful of people with Microlophus, and then, of course, there's more with the other three species. Um but it's not Incredible. like they don't exist currently in pairs and breeding pairs in the United States. It's just a matter of, can we get them to breed um, and then keep those babies alive, get them into the right hands. Cause just cause you breed them and get babies, then getting them into the right hands is a whole other story. If you sell them, you know, just on morph market, for example, the chances of them surviving is very slim. Um, right. It's really right. got to go into other people's hands that are working with the species that know what they're doing or keeping them back. Um, for your own line, like Alex and I have talked about this, if I ever can produce celebensis, uh, people ask me all the time, you know, are you going to sell them? I'm like, no, I'm not going to sell a single one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but it gives some of them to people who I know can take care of them and we can, you know, create further lines of them in the future. So that right there is, I don't know how to, that's like a super old school thing, right? And and, and that, that's, a, I think it's awesome. And most of the species like this that are in that weird space of if one or two things happens, they're just gone, right? It's, it is like 12 
to 20 nerds who probably all know each other. And that that's kind of how it goes, right? Is it, the rarity can drive price and there's monetary things and so on and so forth. And then you find those little pockets of nerds that just don't care and are like, yeah, whatever, man, like mail me a light bulb or something. I'll give you a lizard. Like, and without that, these little pocket species are going to go. And it, it's just really weird to me in that if you hang out long enough and are kind of a big enough nerd to start to get into species like that and to, to see those things, like you can see that all through her pediculture in that there are snakes and frogs and lizards and turtles and, and everybody has their own nerds. And those are the only people keeping a huge number of species available in this country. And it, is because they're like, yeah, man, if I produce them, I'm keeping everything. I'm going to build a second house and <laughs> fill it with sail fins. And then like three of my friends are going to get some. Yep. That's and, the goal. And, and, and but everybody else is like, are you out of your mind? You could sell it on King snake for thousands or whatever. And it's always these like five nerds that are like, nah, it's cool. I'll just give frogs to my friends. <laughs> but, but that, that's the only thing that keeps it going. Right? Yeah. Like true. Her, it, her pediculture started with like five people in a waffle house parking lot, trading King snakes <laughs> with no money because they literally drove into West Texas and found them camping like hippies. And then now it's us with LEDs and herp stats and like super cool stuff. Just trading sail fins in a waffle house parking lot. Like it's the, it's the same thing. I don't know. I just think that's super cool. And I, I've been very fortunate. So like, as I've been doing these interviews with the podcast, like it seems like these are the people I keep running across is a bunch of nerds. Like you guys that are like, oh, I want to keep them all forever. All of them. And then like yeah. three of my buddies will get them. Then yeah, you're not them. Is, there is no <laughs> money in sail and dragons. I tell everyone, every time I've talked about sail and dragons, there is no money in them. And and not even because I plan to keep them all, but because they're not worth a lot, which blows my mind too. Like we're talking between 450 and 650 for the common species that we have here in the United States. And honestly, sure. a celebensis and microlophus, I have yet to really see a lot of babies be for sale. They're they're like the ones I've acquired were juveniles or adults and they're you know a thousand or two thousand dollars but they're not a lot of money um and you only have a couple babies like you're talking like three four eggs right. so the most i've ever had at a clutch was like six um so it's not it's there is no money in sale for dragons <laughs> right i'm not feeding my room off of these these lizards so i feel like the people that are in this hobby like alex and myself and and some of the others we really do it because we want, we love them first of all, and because we want right. to conserve them. That that's really why why I keep them, and I think why Alex is like gonna keep them and, and so interested in them. It's not for the money, that's for sure. So now, I, knowing Alex and, and he's going to school for wildlife things and, and knowing a little bit about his background, I I I get I get I get Alex. <laughs> um so for you like how why why sail fins like i i mean they're cool i i think they're cool and i am a nerd for them also but like why did you did you just see one and thought they were cool or did you keep your first one and really enjoy it or how did it how did it blossom into this now you're the person did you just show up with one and thought they were fun and it just snowballed or like what happened? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I have like the least, not to give a long story, but I had like the least traditional reptile history. I, my husband was in the military. Someone had an iguana and iguana in their dorm. I played with the iguana. I love the iguana. My first lizard was a bearded dragon. And then I got a sailfin dragon because I saw oh, one. In book. Okay. So it was my second lizard ever which is and then they're not you know a, i would not consider them a beginner species so i 
I've uh, had a lot of trial and error to get where I am, to put it simply. Um, okay. But yeah, I saw one in a book and I spent uh, over a year trying to find one. Um, and I found one and I fell in love with it. And just like you said, it, it kind of snowballed out of control to where I am now. It, okay. It's not, that, it's not that exciting of a story. I wish I had something better. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it kind of has to go that way. I mean, for you to get that deep into it or for anyone, for any species, right? It, it would have to be something where it's like, no, I kept one and, and this was the light bulb, you know, cause it, it's just too difficult to get this far into it. Right. And yeah. without, nope, that's it. You know, without you having the clear path of that, you don't accidentally end up here with, you know, especially given the size of some species and things like that. Like it's, that's a great deal of dedication to end up in that space. So yeah, it, it makes sense that it would start that way. Like, nope, right out of the gate, found it, foot on the yeah. gas. There we go. Well, I talk about this a lot with, with people. It's just like, there's nothing wrong with having a big collection of a lot of different species, um, you know, both snakes and lizards. There's nothing wrong with that. But I like to find what I'm really passionate about. So I work with Aspidites and Hydrosaurus. And I want to know everything I possibly can about both. I want to know a lot about a little instead of a little about a lot. And I sure. want to make the way I keep these two species the best I possibly can. Um, so I have other, you know, pythons in my collection now, but even from the beginning, I just like fell in love with them and I'm passionate about them. And it, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with like having a bunch of different species, but I just, I, I wish more people would want to know about their history and about, you know, I just think there's there's value in, in learning a lot about the species you work with, um, yeah. whether they're popular or not. More than the reptiles.com care sheet, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, and I would argue that specifically if they're not popular, there's great value in doing it the way that you're doing it because they're not popular. You, you know, it the standard pet reptiles right that list of 10 species or whatever there's just tons and tons and tons of information because they've been popular since the 70s right you know when you start to get into weird agamids and and goofy snakes and and stuff like that like yeah if, if you have an interest in that you're going to have to compile all that information kind of yourself because it it really won't be easily available to you because they're not the base 10 species that everybody knows, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense that if, if you're going to go this way, it kind of has to be the way that you did it, you know? Well, and for sailfin specifically, and I know Alice can attest to this is there is no information. There is, here's some suggestions on what to feed them and where to put them. And that's as far as it goes. There is no information on breeding. There is no, inf I mean, Literally, when I started with sailfins, well, first of all, I didn't have a Facebook and I didn't have an Instagram. I didn't know there were groups, you know, on, on Facebook. I knew nothing. I found Scott Corning. He had one care sheet on his website, and that's that's all that existed. And I think if you are into sailfins now, you're still not going to find a whole lot. So it was a matter of digging deep in forums, you know, on the Internet and, and just trying sure. to to talk to other people and, and pick out little pieces of information and build it up to what I thought was right, which would then fail. And then I would <laughs> build back up and then it would fail again. And here I am now with what I think works, but it will probably fail again at some point. Sure. So between the two of you, you are, you're very well versed in the community of sailfins, it would seem. Um, so do you find that is, is European herpeticulture any different than US herpeticulture? Like, are they kind of the same wavelength there or more or less popular? Or are we kind of the only ones working on it? Or do you know how, how that plays out with other communities in herpeticulture? So 
to my knowledge, at least uh, over in Europe, the the <laughs> you mainly in Germany, uh, and I don't know if you understand the joke. How every time a new species is described, two Germans pack their suitcases. Um, but that pretty is much just not true, sir. Oh no, no, definitely not. But seriously, literally, what is it? I and it really didn't occur to me until after the salphins were described. And now just this year, we're actually seeing Microlophus and Celebensis noticeably being imported in the States. Like that's not a coincidence. Yeah. And then a bunch of the, you know, the Germans, they're way more nerdy about reptiles than we are here in the States. Sure. And you see on these German Instagram accounts, which, you know, I have to literally type in Hydrosaurus, you know, like, or however they spell it in German mm -hmm. to find these on the hashtags. And what do you know? They've already got fresh, wild caught, three foot adult microlophus and celebensis. They're not getting them to breed yet, but the point is they get them imported like that. And sure. as far as the UK, there is one guy that I do know has a reverse trio. Uh, he's okay. looking to sell his one male and keep the most phenotypically perfect pair. And then uh, the other guy, uh, his name's actually Ben Owens. And he is already on F2 generation Malukan Sailfin Dragons. Okay. Yeah. Which is really astounding because as far as I'm concerned, I only know of two people in the United States with Malukan Sailfin Dragons. And of those two, I only know one that has bred them. So okay. the, 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 for some reason, and that's what we now understand as the true Hydrosaurus Ambonensis. That's from Ambon and Serene. And uh, they're small. Uh, you know, I'd like to compare them. You know, they, they look like finned water dragons, the Chinese mm -hmm. water dragons. Very yep. green, reticulated pattern. They're gorgeous, purple sheen on the sail. But again, just not a lot of people working with them in the States. And from what I understand, they are the most difficult to acclimate of the species for some reason. Um, I talked to Scott Corning, and he said back in you know, the glory days of her pediculture, he could import 40 of them and after six months you'd have two left because they'll they'll wow. you'll have like the initial die off of 12 and you've got some that make to four months and they crash you get some that make to six months and you've got two left but then it seems right. once you get them acclimated they breed like crazy like i said ben owen is on uh he's on f2s which is pretty impressive i won't lie because i mean his his males and his females are the perfect representation of that malukan self and dragon phenotype the reticulation is just spot on uh, and i think honestly part of it is just due to the husbandry like if you're not nailing your diet if you're not providing variety proper uv lighting you know calcium vitamin d3 the whole shebang it, it, sometimes you see sail fins that are clearly say um a weber's sail fin but it looks nothing like say Casey's Weber's, if she, you know, you know what I mean? Like the, the care difference sure. is so tricky to meet. And then just to meet that care and then to breed them and then to do that exact same care for babies, it, it just, it takes time. And uh, right. they're, from what I understand, they do not mature quickly. You're talking two and a half, three years minimum, if not closer to five years for ideal sexual reproduction. And it's okay. just, yeah, it's, there's a lot to it. And I said the, the most experience I ever have even breeding the sail fins would have been when I worked at the wildlife discovery center. We have a pair of Philippine sail fins yep. that were gifted. That's us who I was talking part. about. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, I mean, and even then though, you know, again, I didn't have information. We got so many eggs. We lost so many clutches. So, yeah. I mean, I'm like embarrassed how many we lost. Uh, but to my knowledge, last time I heard Rob's got some eggs cooking and I do believe, or at least I'd like to hope he's changed that incubation method, but it's just, they're tricky. Right. And uh, even like I was talking with Scott Corning, who is pretty much the man, you know, he's kept and bred hydrosaurs for 30 years before they were ever cool. And even he said, you know, the first few clutches on the ground are just, they just take time. And that's why he right. truly believes waiting that five years to get them to breed is so important. And that's the issue is in a hobby where everything can breed at 1300 grams. If you feed it a rat once a week, mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't want to wait that. Right. And that, and like, look at Casey, how many people have adult sail fins like hers? How many right. people want to take the time and the money and the patience? Andrew Acevedo said it best. 
if there's one thing this hobby will teach you, it is patience. And like or I said, well, and you'll yeah, find a new hobby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's just finding, it's not so much people that want sail fins, but finding the people who genuinely want and can provide for them, which is hard. Everybody wants sure. the cool prehistoric dinosaur looking lizard. Oh, Nobody yeah. wants to set up the big aquatic section, which is easy to clean because they poop in it every day. Nobody wants to provide a high carotenoid diet. Nobody wants to gut load five different species of feeder roaches and then feed tilapia fillets that you buy at a Kroger, right? Because then it, it gets expensive. They're like, really? All this for $150 wild caught Weber sailfin? Yeah. Right. But then everybody wants, like you said, the two thousand dollars celebensis. You know, they, they, you're going to spend that much on a lizard. You might as well spend even more caring for it properly. And people don't want to do that. And so that's I've sort of that hurts. in yeah. a bunch of different ways on a bunch of different podcasts. Of so before, um, in between college and my current reptile nerdery, my wife and I were elbow deep into doing saltwater stuff, and. Dude, like $20 coral, I had a tank that cost more than my car and then had like snails in it or something stupid. It just like no money on the animals or the coral. Like you can, you know, you can buy a crazy fish or, or whatever, but like very little money is spent on the inhabitants because they're they're all beautiful. So you just pick your beautiful color and it's 20 bucks. And then, dude, the, the setup, Serious, like I'm not kidding. I think the setup in my room costs more than the car I currently drive. Like it was a lot of money. And yeah, man, like I can't imagine dropping big money on any animal and then just putting it in like a 40 breeder or whatever. Like, what are you doing? I, I don't know. I, I just never I've never understood that. Like, I, I don't know why we do that. It, it's very weird. I, I don't know. It, I think it, it comes back to, like, my thing of you have to be passionate about the sail fins because, like Alex said, it is, it's a lot of work. It's not something you can put in a 40-gallon tank and call it a day. You know, it's, it's really, it is, they are very high maintenance in my opinion. They cost a ton of money. It is so much work to change their waters. If you're lucky enough to have some sort of like filtration system or like Alex and I have talked over and over again about some of the options that you can do to make cleaning their water easier. But for me, it's manually cleaning out Rubbermaid containers daily. Like it is a full-time job and I have a full-time job <laughs> to, to take care of these lizards. So there's part of me that wonders that, you know, is the reason why they're not so popular and we don't see them because they don't live long. Yes. I, I, you know, 100%. Or, I don't know. I, I, there are a lot, there are a lot. More oh, I'll more. throw down on that one for you. Yeah. You guys are, you guys are important. You were in a magazine. I'm not, I'll, <laughs> I'll throw down on that. That's how, that's all the way it thing. There is a reason. So like some of the stuff I keep is stupid. I, I like yellow anacondas, like stupid things that don't like people. They live in water and they poop in it and they try to bite you in the face and also a musk on your face. They're awful. And then everybody looks around and goes, wow, they're so beautiful, man. Like, how come those aren't more popular? And it's like, <laughs> well, because they suck. That's why. Mm -hmm. Like, they get I huge. <laughs> yeah, they get huge. They try to bite you in the face and then also poop on your face that they bit. And they can aim it and they're really aggressive. Like, that's why. That's the answer. Also, they're yellow and beautiful. So I have one like, but that's, that's why when people get them, they, any kind of species like that, pump out a ton of babies, get kind of big. They're basically a garbage disposal. Boy, how come they aren't in the hobby more often? They're dead. Like they didn't, they're not hanging out in Illinois where I live. They're not alive. Like yeah. it, because they were a lot of work and you didn't do the work and then they faded and they're reptiles. So when they start to crash, they crash and they're gone unless you're going to go to the vet. And since you wouldn't spend the money on their enclosure, you won't spend the money on the vet and they're gone. Yeah. Like that's, that sucks, but that's hundred percent. Like no question why there aren't 8,000 adult veiled chameleons in the United States. Yeah. Boy, there's a ton of babies. 
<laughs> Come on, dude. Like, yeah, that for real. And it, yeah, that kind of like Justin was saying. That people like the concept of them was, more than the reality of them. I'm just going to read that comment because that's very yeah. well said. <laughs> yeah. So I, in the chat, I, I missed a couple I wanted to come back to. Um, Scott asked how you deal with nose rubbing, which seems to be common. His assumption was that very large enclosures, which I would assume as well. And then we also had um, the on the enclosure care type of thing. How different is it among the five as far as care uh, requirements aside from size, obviously. I'll talk real quick about the nose rub and then Alex, if you want to add anything you can, I'd actually say the bigger is not better for enclosure size. Um, oh. and someone might fight me on this, but in my opinion, smaller is sometimes better. Um, especially with babies. If you give them too much room, they get freaked out and that's how they rub their face. Um, Okay. Glass is terrible. Anything that they can see through is terrible from babies to adults. Even my adults have very minimal viewing area for me and for them. Um, oh, mesh like chicken wire. And I learned the hard way with this is, is terrible as well. They will smash their face into anything that they can see through and it will, the nose rub will happen overnight. It's not something that like, oh, it's rubbing its nose and then a week goes by and they have this, it's something like you look at them before you go to bed and the next morning you wake up and you can see half of their nose is gone. That's oh, how wow. it happens. Um, so visual, if you have to use glass, like visual barriers, just putting, wrapping your enclosure in paper. Um, some, some things about the enclosure, though, that I've kind of found out the hard way is higher is also not better. I've had lizards that have jumped from very high, they and their water's at the bottom of the enclosure, and they don't really understand the height. And yes, in the wild, they will jump very high distances, you know, from branches above streams into streams, but uh, they, every single one of them that I've put in high enclosures jumps and, like, you can hear it. It's it's not a friendly sound. But bigger, in my opinion, is is by no means better until you have an acclimated adult that you know is okay with a big space. Okay. But yeah, vis the visual thing, the being able to see out of the enclosure, that's where I think 99% of the nose rub happens. And stress. I've had one cage that was facing another cage like, this is me just being an idiot. And they could see each other. This is not just sail and dragons. And the, the sure. guy is, you know, getting stressed out. And that's when he rubbed his face. So they like quiet and they like no, they don't want to see anything. Okay. Alex, okay. do you have anything to add to that? You, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Uh, the one thing that I would also comment on, though, is that the height. A lot of people, and again, Scott Corning told me like that was the first thing he figured out is you know they they do climb, but I would honestly compare the behavioral aspect of hydrosaurus to more just like a marine iguana or treat them like a cyclora. So they will make more use of say a eight foot by four foot by four foot than a six foot by six foot tall. Give okay. them that floor space to breed, to run around. That way they can still get their exercise. But like Casey said, you know, they're big and heavy. They're they're not graceful. They're not Draco flying lizards. You know, they're the largest in the family of agamids. So treat them sort of more like a cyclora. Uh, and it, honestly, at first I was surprised to hear that. And then, you know, with the beautiful thing called the internet, if you go on iNaturalist, right, where you can see all of our favorite herps in the wild, and you just yeah. type in the genus Hydrosaurus, where do you see them? They are literally sitting on ground level rocks in the middle of streams. They're not eight feet up a tree. You know, okay. maybe you'll see them on a snag overhanging a stream. And that snags, what, three, four feet off the ground? Not this six to eight to 12 foot setup that the zoo has or that the care sheet told you or the other internet expert. You know, it seems that to get this species to thrive, you truly need to just give them big area to soak poop that's easy to clean like a fast moving river and give them a lot of floor space and a lot of stuff where they can still get that exercise, but not fall and hurt themselves. I mean, and then 
just like Casey said with nose rubbing, solid sides. You know, one of my favorite companies like Animal Plastics or any PVC that's just solid sided and can handle the 80% humidity these guys need, you know, ask, hey, can you make the substrate lip 18 inches high? And then put the basking near the back, put all your sticks angled towards the back. So when they're on the ground level, they cannot see through. And that way you can still, in a sense, have display set up, but that way you're just minimalizing the chance of a nose rub injury as quickly as possible. But then again, like Casey said, sometimes they climb up and they see that the substrate lip is the barrier, but the glass is on the top. So then they try to jump from the four foot high shelf through the glass. And sometimes you truly just have to completely cover the enclosure, which I can attest when I visited Scott Corning's facility, you cannot see into any of his sail fins and you wonder why his sail fins look perfect. It's sort of that beauty right. has a cost. And if you want to have a perfect sail fin, you have to give them what they want. And what they want is to not see you or anything that could stress them out. I so, would say though that see, over time, a I've taken... and an Amazon tree boa smushed together. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Got it. <laughs> Cyclorazon Got it. tree boa. Yeah. Lots of, lots of trees that they're not climbing they're hiding behind because they hate you and enough space that they can run away from you got it precisely got it that sounds awful i would say though <laughs> that they they learn to trust you like i know people roll their eyes at me when i say this but not at all one of those species that the more you are in its presence, the more it will trust you. Now, not with all of them. Like I have sure. a rubbery or a tribrid that is just absolutely crazy and there's nothing I'm ever going to do that's going to calm him down and he will hate me till the day he dies. But for the majority of them, I have gained their trust and therefore I've been able to give them like every six months, I'll give them a little bit more of the visual, like I can see into their cage a little bit more. And now some of them I have majority of their sides open um not all of them but they're, they're not display animals i guess is what i'm trying to say but you yeah. can gain their trust um it's it's interesting because even with damien he when i got him i got him as an adult he was he scared the crap out of me i mean he's a big guy and he would run all over the cage whip his tail at me even when i looked at him through this enclosure and over like two years I can go in, I can touch him, I can pick him up, I can put him on my arm now. He lets me in the enclosure. But if my husband walks in, he freaks out. So you can definitely, these are, I mean, they're very rewarding if you give them the time and patience. Going back to patience is the key with these guys. They're big visual lizards. I So that's for my wife and I, my wife specifically, um, big lizards are, that's her jam. She large monitors, tegu, so on and so forth. And that, so aside from the very specific thing you guys are talking about with visual barriers and, and, and that type of thing and just proper enclosure design, right? Our experience or my experience of watching her as she works is I think that is most people's failure point with any large lizard species is it takes forever and i don't know like we we get really stuck right in that oh, we keep reptiles and we keep scaly animals we don't keep animals like cats and dogs and fur nerds and all that crap and i don't totally buy that when it comes to really big lizards because my wife works big lizards and moderately sized crocodilians the exact same way you work a dog and that that works like i i know it works i have like 12 of them so it for sure works and i think the the only difference that i heard you describe was proper enclosure setup like you you have an animal with very specific needs in in a very specific environment and then you you made that and then went to work Right. Yeah. And it, yeah, I just think that really for any large lizard, like that's a failure point for a lot of people, right? Is you get a big green iguana. They're scary. Like the, they don't like you, you know, and, and people discount the, they know the difference. Like, 
uh, iguanids specifically can be very gender dependent and I, we have personal experience with that but as far as like their visual ability like you you're 100 percent right and i i believe you without without question that if your husband shows up different story and they know the difference and i know that because i'm a big dude with a beard and my wife is not a big dude with a beard and our lizards act different if you look like me or you look like her i mean that's that happens you know and it but that can also add into when we're talking about people not having successes you know you get a lot of little import ones or you get some very big import ones um and then as especially with the little ones they're all going to get to their total jerk off teenage years and you know it's going to be a disaster you're going to have to set up an enclosure where you never mess with them and just let them get through that and then put in the work that you were describing you know a big import adults may never get through their jerk years They'll just be a jerk forever because you're the scary monkey trying to eat them in the jungle. You know, it, yeah, I, I believe that a hundred percent that from you to your husband, there'd be a, a massive difference. And with the, I'm talking, when I'm talking about Damien, the guy who took me two years, he was an adult. Now, if you're sure. talking, you get a baby, it's years before they calm down. In my opinion. Now, some people have had, it really, I do think is, uh, can be different for the individual, but for the most part with, with my tail fins that I've had from either a hatchling that I've produced or someone that's giving me a baby, it is years before I can hold them or before the process of me getting out is okay. They're going to run around the cage and smash their face in for five minutes. And then I'm going to corner them and then I'm going to get them out, not sure. to, like pick them up and they're going to go on my arm. So it is, yeah. You have to have so much patience and, and you're, you know, we've been talking about this the whole time. I think people just want something from day one that they're going to be able to pick up, put on their arm, take a picture of, you know, like that's, that is not how this works at all. So I, and I keep comparing it to other species because I'm, nobody keeps these. So I'm trying to give folks other ideas, you know, um, it, everything that you guys describe so do you ever keep have you ever kept tenosaura or do you have any experience with tenosaura i, I worked of, with tenosaura baker right the they go through Center. the ugly phase, yeah oh, right? oh. Ba well babes <laughs> no figuratively and literally right babies are cool adults are cool and then all of them from like two to four years old yep. are brown and they hate everybody <laughs> and that is all of the rescue stuff that i've done all of the when you just like really want to hate yourself for a while. So you scroll through Craigslist and look up reptile or lizard. That's what you see. Oh, I've had, I've had Skippy for two years and now he really doesn't like me. And it's a picture of a Brown lizard. That's about 18 inches long. And it's usually like this at the camera, you know, it's just and it's like, emo phase. yeah, it, yes. It's like, Oh, if you would just, suffer with your lizard for another year it would be super cool i promise because i you meet people who have adults of those species and they're like oh yeah they're amazing and it's like yeah man you know like we our rhinoceros iguana from 18 inches to 24 inches i've never actually abused an animal but that's probably the only one i've really thought hard about it like, boy, I could just kick that thing. Like they was, it was just mean and they bite hard and they eat a lot and they're really expensive for something that hates you. And it's like, man, you know, now do that things like probably three and change. You can scratch him behind the head and he eats tortoise chow out of a bowl. Like he's a total idiot, but dude, you have to suffer. You just do you know and it yeah it, we just keep describing all of the terrible things about this species and why people don't keep them but it they are really great but you're you're right you like i have to wear it, gloves up to my elbows sometimes i mean they like whip their head back around and try and oh, yeah. off, but you don't even understand how they got their head there and i'm just I'm like i, I just want to love you i'm not really sure why you hate me so much but it, you're describing exactly what i go through <laughs> 
Yeah. And it, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm weird, I guess. Like, I don't get why people don't. That's awesome. Like that. I think that is what is like, I thought those lizards were awesome. And then to hear you describe that, I think that makes it more awesome. And I don't know how to, because like, like I have a bunch of bearded dragons. Okay. And I use them for educational shows. They're wonderful. They're a great pet. You can put them on a kid's head. Awesome. Yeah, great. That, you know, and it's like, yeah, I got one. It hatched. It ate some bugs. It ate a whole lot of bugs. And then it got really big and it eats a lot of bugs. And it'll like hang out on your shirt and it's yellow. It's pretty cool. And that's, that is cool. I, I love it. I have several. But like, it's not rewarding. This, yeah, it's and, not rewarding to it, me. It's it's all it's like a. I have always said that this is like a hobby, and in that, if if you were woodworking with your grandpa when you were seven, okay, and now you're fifty two years old, and you've been woodworking the whole time, you're not a hobbyist. You're probably a professional artisan when it comes to creating wooden sculptures or whatever you and your grandpa did. And now you're a grandpa, right? You're, you're a professional. You might not make your living at it, but your skill set and abilities in an artistic hobby have progressed over 10, 20, 40 years. And now you are an artisan, a professional level of whatever it may be. It doesn't matter what your hobby is. This has always felt like that to me. Like, oh, you, you kept a bearded dragon alive and, and had a wonderful adult and this, that, and the other. And awesome. Like, I don't I don't want you to kill it. I, I want you to have a, a good go of it with that. And then you went to a sailfin dragon and it was awful and a ton of hard work. And then you broke the stupid wood thing and had to buy a new set. And your grandpa never told you how terrible it was. And now you're like on and on and on and then you get through to the end and it's like these things still hate me but they're alive and you can look at them and they won't just die from nothing so we're better like it's no it's it's the level of work that it takes like i think that's amazing and it i don't know her pediculture kind of isn't on that same wavelength i guess like that it would be a huge not to kind of knock the entire podcast that we're doing but it, it's probably going to be a turnoff for a lot of people to hear how insanely difficult they are but i think that's good like i i want i want like 50 nerds in the u.s to do awesome keeping these and then the other herpeticulture nerds can kind of figure it out you know what i mean like you don't just want 11,000 people at the big box pet store to show up and get these knowing that they're this difficult. You, you know what I mean? Does it that is, make sense? It, it, it makes perfect sense. And I've actually just had this conversation with somebody about how I hate to say this out loud, but when it comes to selling the babies that I've produced, I'm super selective, like very selective not something that I would just like sell to someone that messaged me on morph market with three sentences, like, Oh, you sent me the money here. It's the lizard. Like I kind of vet people out. I want to know, do they have experience? Like it's a it's kind of a process and I need to like have some sort of understanding with this person that you are at least, if you don't know what you're doing, going to be interested enough in the species that you're going to take the time to learn and listen to me to figure out what's the right thing to do. And so I hope exactly what you're saying that it does weed out this conversation, the people who think they're cool and want them because they look cool. Um, as opposed to the people who I'm not saying you need to have one to get another one, or you need to have experience, but just like want, like have a little bit of passion for the species enough to learn um, or to ask questions. Like the first time I ever bought a salesman, the person that sold it to me called me and we had a 15, 20 minute phone conversation. And he didn't care that this was my first sale and dragon. He just cared that I cared enough 
to ask him questions and to talk with him for 20 minutes. And that's why he sold this hold back to me. Um, and so I hope it does weed, weed people out. And I am very selective when it comes to, to selling for this exact reason, because I don't want them to get into the hands of people who saw them on Instagram one time. And now they have a lizard who they have no idea what to do with it. It's mean to them. They don't like it. And then next thing you know, they're not feeding it. There's an improper and then it dies. Moral of the story. Right. Yeah. Well, and it kind of like what Alex was saying earlier. So you kind of caught yourself, right? You said pet keeper. And then you really quick were like, I'm not trying to make fun of pet keepers because yeah, I'm a young no, dude. No, I said, I no offense to them. Like, yeah, I, I keep a lot of, them. I have cool more pets than it. I do breeding stuff. Like I said, I've but had, I think where that idea got in your head is her pediculture, people like me and her pediculture, right? I have a gigantic collection. I've been doing this forever. I have a wealth of useless knowledge about keeping lizards alive. And we talk about pet keepers in kind of a denigrating way in that they only keep species that are pet quality in that they're very easy. Because, you know, we always equate back to, oh, you keep a cat or a dog, like put some food out, let it poop outside. And it's, it's simple in comparison. And then we like to think that we're different or better somehow because we keep things that need UV and bugs with carrot juice in them or whatever. And it's, it's not, right? Like, that isn't a negative term. We, we sort of treat it that way, but like, if, if you just keep one of the 10 readily available pet species of reptiles because they're easy to keep and they're cool, that's awesome. Like, that's 95% of the hobby that has a leopard gecko and, like, some colored sand or whatever. Like, we can think that they're dorks, but they make up our entire industry, you know, or one ball python or, or whatever the popular cool thing is now. And it's it's not a knock to those people or people at that level to say this is a different level. Like I'm not saying don't buy a sale fin. I'm saying it isn't a pet level animal. This is a different level. If you would like to step up your game, then this is an option for that. But if you just want to chill with a crested and a leopard and a bearded rock on. Like I fully support that, but just understand that that's the level, you know what I mean? And white lips and sail fins and any iguanid of any kind, big monitors, any of these things where it's like, they're awesome. And with modern herpeticulture and all the cool stuff we have access to, you can keep almost anything alive but it's a different level. Right. And it, I don't think we, I don't think we explain that to newer people without making fun of them. Yeah. You, pretty you much tell I mean? them don't take calculus right <laughs> after you had pre-algebra. Yeah. But it's, uh, but it's a personality thing, right? Like <laughs> Casey, this is the first time I've ever talked to you, but I, I've hung out with Alex quite a few times and it, it's a personality thing of, and, and you have that the, the way you have described it here has been exactly what I'm saying. Like you are super positive about these animals. You clearly greatly enjoy them. And then you told us all of the things that suck about them. And that that's legit. Like they're wonderful and you love them. And you obviously have put in a ton of time and effort. And then also you suffer through it <laughs> with all of your time and effort and, and you explain that. And it, I don't know. I, I just wish we were better at that. Like, I'm, I'm glad to have the two of you on because you are, you do a really good job of it. it. But yeah, that's, I think we could do better with bunches of species. If we had more personalities of I'm not trying to blow your heads up too big, but like, like, the, like this caliber of personality where you, you know, you, you didn't, you're not preaching it up like your zoo experts keeping sail fins. You, you just laid out how hard it is. And then also that they're awesome. 
you know, and I, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't want to romanticize yes. what, what they are. Um, if I look, I just had my cell Bensis out two days ago and I look at him and he's beautiful. And, you know, I'm sure I post that picture on social media and 15 people now want to sail from dragon. But when I look at him, I look at all the hard work that I've done to get that animal to look like that. Like, that's what I see. Yeah. I look at him and that's what's rewarding to me and, and the way he's calm now and all these things. Um, but I don't, I going back to like when I selectively pick people to sell the lizards to, I'm honest with them. I don't want to romanticize it. I don't want them to just see the picture on Instagram. Um, I've had people that I've talked to that I've been honest with, but not negative, And they've decided not to purchase the animal. Um, Which is good. And exactly what we're talking about. Like, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving all, you know, the downfalls of an animal because that's, that's not negativity. That's, that's honesty. That's preparing someone. Um, yes. And we do need to have more conversations like this because I think, Someone that at the end of this whole conversation that's still listening to this podcast and <laughs> wants one even more than they did before they started, that's the person I want to sell one to. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it, yeah, I just, I hope, I don't know, all these other podcast nerds need to get on it, man. Have cool people that you interview that do it the right way. Right? Her Pediculture Network, who's in the chat, get on it. <laughs> So we are cruising past an hour. What, what did I miss? What, what is your giant sales pitch for how awesome sail fins are and also not? No. Um, um, yeah. I mean, what do you, I was going to say, I just say? saw in your chat, uh, the legend himself, Mr. Eric Haycraft, uh, asking, yes. do sail fins in captivity develop on par with their wild counterparts? I'd say, yeah. Um, I think he's probably asking regarding his work with Basiliscus. We all know that Plumafrons and Vitatis and Basiliscus and whoever has Galleritis, but as far I'm, as far as I'm concerned, nobody has those in the States, but, uh, what's it called? Um, sail fins definitely seem to develop just like they do in the wild. If anything, you probably see a couple missing spikes here and there from somebody that doesn't have them with the proper humidity. Or, I mean, I've talked with Casey on this. When they breed, like, they get really rough. So, you know, a male riding down a female across the bottom of the cage, he might rub off a spine or two. But as right. far as, like, you know, physical development, as long as you have a high varied diet, again, a lot of carotenoids, they're going to look just like they do in the wild. Generally, okay. if you see a watered down sailfin, say a, a Philippine sailfin dragon, which is known for their purples and blues, but then somebody has one that looks brown and then you realize it gets because they're feeding it just iceberg lettuce and crickets. And it's like, well, there you have it. That's why sure. it's not developing. But it's like, if you look at Casey's sailfins, you can just see, you know, her celebensis has that bright cream centered body. Yellow, as I, I'm pretty sure is, derived from carotenoids you know that because if you see how she feeds her sail fins you know high variety salad insects select proteins and what do you know they look like they do in the wild yeah. um but as far as you know i'd say comparing them to the basiliscus it's not like where you can do everything perfect for a pluma fronds and his back fin is only two inches where in the wild they get like six inches higher whatever right. so yeah um, there's a lot not, of weird yeah mm -hmm. but uh, i'm not sure yeah why why basilis are like that i'm not really well versed in them i have a friend that loves them but uh as far as comparing them to hydrosaurus there's really they look just like they do in the wild pretty much with good care with good care uh, which okay. can be said about a lot of reptiles in captivity but the sales Damn. pitch put effort in and you'll uh you'll you'll enjoy them i mean like i said i've i do not personally keep hydrosaurus but I've worked with the Pusillatus at a previous job, and I have a really good friend that had Celebensis, he had Weberi, and he had a bunch of tribrids and hybrids. So that was where I was able to get a lot of my hands-on care. And it is work. I mean, not everybody's willing to voluntarily drive half an hour after school to go down and change lizard water for somebody. 
But for me, nerd. I know I'm such an like, you know, they're <laughs> like, why don't you go to parties? Mom, I want to clean crap water. But, you know, it's it, it. That's the thing is, you know, being a, at least for me, trying to learn as much as I can now. So that way, once I'm finishing my degree and I get my own place and then I can just get a ton of sail fins and do it right. You know, and then of course, share what I've learned at his place with Casey and what Casey's learned with me. And like when I visited Scott, you know, telling Casey what I learned there, you know, literally yeah. when I flew down to Scott, it was a two day lecture. I just brought a notebook and wrote down everything he said. And then I, you know, was on the phone with Casey like a week later, like, hey, here's what I have to share with you. You know, yeah. it's that it's just you, you got to have good communication. And like I said, you know, or as and I said, Casey said, don't be afraid if you're somebody that wants a sale fin and you buy from an awesome keeper and breeder like Casey to ask questions because <laughs> you know, people don't go through blood, sweat, and tears to keep a species alive and appreciate it for nothing. You know, there's so a reason think, that's there. I, I probably don't have this issue as much, but it, that that's gotta be a thing, right? Like if, if you bought an animal from the person, right. And, and we always make fun of care sheets and which is crazy because they're very useful, but people will like get a care sheet or whatever from their breeder or, Hey, how'd you have them set up? Yada, yada. And they get the basics of what they're doing. And I, I got to wonder if people are like kind of embarrassed to like ask more questions. You know what I mean? Because if you're, cause if you're buying it from the person, you don't want to look like an idiot. Like I, I bought this from you and don't know what I'm talking about. It, you know, you, I don't know. I, that's, I think that is kind of incumbent on the seller, I guess. To, I don't even know how to explain, like to be approachable. I don't know. Like, cause you, if, if the person is buying the animal from you, like ask me, I, what do you want to know? Like, uh, here's my filter. This is the tub I use. This is the, I, I would want to give you all of the information because I produced it. I don't want you to kill it. I, I want you to be successful. And so like, I, yeah, I don't know how to short of like putting a little sticker on your website of like, please ask me all of the stupid questions. I will answer them, but, you know, and it, yeah, I've, I've got to think that there, are, right. There's going to be a little bit of hesitancy or like an embarrassment, I guess. Like you don't want to ask the Python guy, like, why do you keep him at 84? Like, I don't really know. You don't want to look like an idiot. You know what I mean? And, yeah, I can see that where people kind of set themselves up for failure by not asking those questions of a person who clearly would give you all of this information, right? 100%. And I was that person. Like, I don't know why we do this. When I first got into sale fins, I had one that wasn't doing so great. I, I got in over my head. I didn't know what I was doing. And you're absolutely right. I was like embarrassed that someone was going to think not that they even knew me that I wasn't a good keeper because of the way I was caring for them. But if I would have just asked them the questions, I probably could have fixed the problem. Like, I don't know what that is, but I'm sure you're right. And I, I haven't really thought about it like that before, but it, it's almost like maybe other people think that I'm going to judge them or we're going to judge them hundred percent on their question. But the question is only going to help them get better. Like I was that person. So I'm not judging anybody. Uh, so I, I wonder if, so to me, that kind of makes sense as the genesis of the care sheet in that everybody buys all these animals from me. They disappear into the ether. I never see any results of that. And then nobody asked me any questions. So everybody that bought a corn snake for me is a rat snake expert. Well, that's impossible. But nobody asked me any questions. And then I never saw the snakes again. And so for me, I would, I would immediately think I just sold 40 corn snakes and they all died. Like I would freak out, right? Because especially in the age of social media, you're going to go on Instagram and you're going to show me and then it's going to go through on a genetic color change. You're going to show me all the stuff. 
and I'm going to see a 30 inch sail fin dragon because they're cool and you're going to show it off. If you don't, and I'm the guy you got it from, then the only reason not to show me is because something bad happened. So maybe that's why care sheets get pushed so hard on is because breeders like, because nobody will ask them. And so they're like, you know what? Here's a sheet for all of the stupid things you were going to ask. You don't even have to ask, man, just read them. And please don't kill this thing. I spent five years trying to produce. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your money. <laughs> you know, like, I, well, I the wonder... other side of that, then you do have people like, then there are people who ask way too many questions. You can never have a medium here because True. I had people that like every day have sent me a picture of their sail fin saying, what's this? What's wrong with this? Why'd this happen? You know, so I do want the questions. I'll answer anything. I'll still answer you if you message me every single day, but there are some people that take it overboard. And, and in my head, I think I was that person when I, I wasn't, but that nagging person. But I've also had people that have messaged me that haven't bought something from me. Hey, this is going on. I've tried these things. What are your thoughts? And I end up learning something from that conversation all the time. Like that people, people oh, sure. who me something and you haven't seen or, or what have you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's the kind of the downside for social media, right? is and and i get into this argument with my wife all the time um i am my wife's google and it drives me nuts she, she asks me things and i'm like you have all of the knowledge of human history in your pocket <laughs> and you could you could ask it all sorts of questions and then she's like well i just want you to tell me look it up <laughs> you know like and i i would bet that a lot of the nagging type of questions that come to a person like you are probably the simpler things. It's just because of you're worried about the species, you know, you know, it's high stress and, and there's a lot involved with the species. We get stressed out about the simple stuff. And it's like, there isn't a ton of information, but some stuff you can just Google, you know what I mean? Like if when you, and that's what I, I don't know, like how to, how to parse that out with newer people, like specific weird things that impact an animal's life. Come ask me. Yep. Types of dirt. Google. On your own. <laughs> like, you know, like how do you, you know, kind of differentiate which is which, you know, and then you could just be a smart aleck like Scott and write a book. They wrote a book, Scott, they published it in a magazine. Leave them alone. <laughs> How would also like to know how they compare to other agamids. What I do you just think, saw, Alex's agamids. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I just saw that question. I was waiting for you to finish your beautiful tangent there. Uh, pretty much, they are in their own. I, I oh gosh, I want to say suborder of agamids. So it's like Hydrosaurin, and then it's the five species or something like that. They're truly in a league of their own. They are. Okay. Closely related to, they said Physignathus, which anybody that knows me knows that I love those things. Uh, but as far as, you know, close cousins, the only relation to Intelligama Physignathus is that they're all in a gamidae. You know, okay. uh, Sailfin Dragon is just as closely related as, say, Acrocanthosaura as it is to Physignathus. You know, they're just, they're all in a gamidae, but then it's the suborders and then the genus or... However, that works. I don't know it off the top of my head right now, but hopefully okay. that makes sense. I'd say if you really want to know specifics, definitely check out the reptile database online and just type in hydrosaurus and they'll give you the full phylogenic tree there. But that would be the best way to tell. Okay. Do, do, do. And Michael asked, so is there still scope to get some from the wild in comparison to say Australian species? Are most people working with wild cut or CB? So we talked a little bit earlier about imports and mixing up species and stuff like that. Um, so now, Alex, you said it before, and I'm completely blanking out because I read the question. Tell me again, we can get four of five, mm -hmm. one we cannot, right? And that's the Philippines because yes. they're now considered vulnerable and they stopped exporting them in the 90s. 
So every everything that is sold as a Philippine self and dragon, Hydrosaurus pustulatus, is captive born and bred. Ideally, oh, there was a through Czechoslovakia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, China had a legal large captive breeding program that came over in 2003. Definitely. Um, um, but then, yeah, as far as right now, you can still legally obtain imported specimens of Hydrosaurus ambonensis, Hydrosaurus microlophus, Hydrosaurus celebensis, and Hydrosaurus weberi. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I hope that that stays open because I, they're just, they're hard to get and they're hard to acclimate, you know, for the one that makes it of, uh, you know, the 60 that die, making sure that he stays alive through that importer into say someone like Casey's hands, you know, it's just, it really is a game of odds. And unfortunately right. the odds are not in our favor. Uh, you know, when you're talking about a species that just stresses so easily, you know, some come in better than others, but at the end of the day, like I was saying about Scott Corning's accounts, working with the Malukan Selfins, he'd get 60 in. 60, right? Like that sounds like a math problem I would have in a senior year of high school test. You know, this man has 60 Selfin dragons and he loses 59 of them over the course of six months. What's the average percentage rate that they drop dead over the many days of how many months that is? You know, it's just, it's scary kind of. And True. I think that's one of the other turnoffs of it is, you know, when you're paying, you know, if you know the right people, just over a hundred dollars per import. If you buy five, that's five, six hundred dollars. Right. Maybe for one of them to survive. And then buying five more. Well, now you're already a grand in just imports. And you have to hope that that baby that survived makes it past its first. It's just it's yeah. tough. And, uh, and it's, I'm, you know, yeah. it, it is a, this species seems to be, or group of species, sorry, mm -hmm. seems to be a distillation of the import conundrum, right? Of you, you just got to suffer yep. through it. And yeah, that, and there's hundreds of species that that is true for. And uh, yes, Scott, I agree about when I was saying how sometimes you just have to Google things. Scott's comment was that people, in his opinion, resist Google because of the amount of bad information that is pervasive on the Internet, which is true. Man, that's hard. It, you know, and I feel like you can still. So for Casey, somebody sends her 40 messages about substrate or just something where it's it's like dude it's it's not that hard just look it up you know what i mean you could still tell them oh hey you should check out like you could give them resources i suppose or, or give them a good starting point as far as don't just say like go google it idiot you, you know what i mean like you hey there's a substrate you know, people have talked about substrates in the Hydrosaurus Facebook group or, or you, you know, like I feel like you as the breeder subject matter expert can steer those people without just giving them every single answer. And if if we if people on our end put in that little bit of effort, I feel like you're going to make that person a better keeper and or just generally a better user of modern society like parsing out crappy information on the internet is part of being a human who owns a phone like like you you just have for everything from the weather to lizard dirt like you have to that's a skill set you have to develop i suppose that's been my tactic from day one and i i hope it served me well because i never want to turn somebody away and i never want to make someone feel stupid because again i was that person at one point in time and if someone would have said something kind of catty to me or like a stupid remark like go google it yourself or whatever that could have destroyed my opinion or the way i felt about the reptile community so yeah. i try to do exactly what you said is like well here's an article on this here's a website on this they always come back and ask more questions and that's okay. 
But I just, I do feel like we have a responsibility if people are coming to us for information to never be rude unless they're rude to you, but to yes. just kind of drive them in a direction and hope they go that way and don't come back. But they usually do. <laughs> yeah. Well, to Scott's point, he just said he would rather answer the question than have the animals suffer. I, I agree with that hundred percent. You know, I, I don't want something bad to happen to it, but my right. Like then you're walking a fine line there, right. Of now, now someone in Casey's position would have to kind of parse out questions of like, is this, how important is this to this animal's quality of life? Do I answer it immediately or do I tell them, Hey, check out these lists of carotenoid having vegetables or you know, like it, it just puts more of the onus on you, which I mean, kind of comes with the territory, but well, there's yeah, always it, a line. there's a line when it's like, what substrate do I use? That's one thing. And if it's, I think my animal needs to go to a vet or there's something wrong with it. Yeah. It's another thing. So, and I get a lot of those questions. Apparently I am a veterinarian and I'm not. And I always say, go to the vet and, and like, I can't help you. Here's right. maybe something you can do until you can get an appointment. But like, that's a whole other conversation that I'm never comfortable giving someone advice on something that could potentially end in the death of the animal. Like I don't ever want that to be on me because of advice I've given them. So if it's, you know, enclosure diet, something like that, I'll have a conversation with you. But if it's anything else, I you're on, you're kind of on your own here. And I tell them people that straight up, you need to go to a vet. I'm not a professional. Yeah. I mean, and I, <laughs> I think our hobby grossly underutilizes vets. So I totally agree with that. You know, we, we don't go to them nearly as often as we probably should for a whole host of things that affect our animals. So that's, I think that's smart. Which is crazy. Like, I get that they cost a lot of money. They do. But nine times out of ten that I've taken even a sailfin dragon, and I've taken many sailfin dragons to the vet, we figure it out. They've never seen a sailfin dragon. They have to Google them. They have no idea what they're working with. But we figure it out, you know, together. And that's, an, you know, just because you can pay for the animal doesn't mean you can pay for the vet bills. Like this is another thing. People always ask me, you know, do you do payment plans? So on no, if you can't pay for the animal, how are you going to pay for the thousand dollar vet bill you might have when that thing smashes its face into the wall because you have a glass 40 gallon tank? Which right. Sometimes you do. So I, I don't know why we knock vets so much. Like I've, I've seen so many things on the internet of, Oh, the vet doesn't know what they're talking about, so on and so forth. Like sometimes they're your only option. Sometimes that's that's what we have to do. Yeah, there's and it it kind of I don't know, it's kind of a bad term when you think of it in terms of people, but like um it's kind of doctor shopping, right? In that there are there are places where there are no vets that deal with reptiles, and so becomes incumbent on us to you're you're utilizing the vet all i all i need a vet for is their access to resources and yep. skills the medication and, and and the databases and things that they can look stuff up in and then i need to be good enough at explaining to them what it is they should be searching for and then their training and schooling and skill set kicks in and okay, yeah, this jives and I know what those things mean at least. And now I know the direction I need to go because they're a healthcare professional. And now whether or not you get that relationship with the veterinarian you end up at is a different story. And so that in that instance, it's on us, right? Like, hey, this isn't working how you thought. So you got to go to a different vet or what have you and things like that. But like it that is a failing i think of her pediculture in that you, you you showed up and the vet didn't know everything about pythons like no kidding like tell them like answer questions give them information get 
give this person an avenue to go down and then they have a whole bunch of schooling and resources behind them to get down it with you but like don't show up and be mad because they don't know what a jackson's chameleon is like that's dumb like explain it here's my problem this is what's going on and let them do their work I, i've never got that like that that really bugs me because we're our vet is a reptile nerd and so he helps at his former school and, and their herp club and things like that and that's always been his issue is the vets that call him for you know specific weird stuff it's always like super one-off crazy if it's just it's sick or it needs some medication or dehydration or things like that they're, they're not dumb people. They went to a lot of schooling. They can they can figure it out if you just give them some basic information. And and we we somehow resist that. Like, oh, that guy didn't know that it was ambinensis. Idiot. I'm never letting him touch my lizard. Like, what? Yeah, you didn't not, know that until you read the I article. Know what you're talking like, about ever. Like, I've taken, like I said, my, my sale fence to the vet. They've never heard of them before. But like I said, we work together this was a team effort i'm not a veterinarian but we had long conversations we were on the computer together like and this is multiple vets that i've been to you're you're absolutely right you couldn't have said it better you can't go in and say here's my animal fix it like (laughs) yes i am going to be mad at you because you're not going to know what you're doing you have to go in and work as a team together but you're half of that team and you even if you don't know all the answers you need to come prepared with as much information as you can. And then I guess in this case, reach out to some people like myself. Hey, has this happened to you? You know, what, what has, what has worked sure. for you? I'm at the vet's office, that kind of thing. But when you say, I don't have, this is the conversation I think I'm talking about is I don't have money for the vet. What can I do? Okay. That's the yeah. conversation people have with me. Different story. Yes. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, Which is that's crazy. yeah. Or I don't take my animals to the vet because they always just take my money. Like, well, I. It, <laughs> I yeah, that, you. That's why you ask the vet questions and talk with them so you can get the most out of their time. Yeah. Yeah. And it. Oh. Uh, well, that's that's it. probably. Oh, sorry, Bill. No, no, no. That the person that sends that message probably doesn't also have the information to give to the vet. And it's yeah. that's probably a compounding issue, I would assume, yeah. right? And you know, yeah. Um, what was I gonna say? The um, there was a comment from Herpeticulture asking the about. One? Uh, no, it was regarding vets, so we stay on that topic. But uh, how reliable is your local vet? Well, if actually to answer that if your vet isn't local uh just go to arav.org we've got it go. right at our fingertips so uh just quick shout out on that arav is i believe the american reptile and amphibian veterinarian association i think that's the uh, some something like that association of reptile and amphibian veterinarians yeah right? yeah so something like yeah. that but pretty It'll much show up. yeah if uh, th- you type in like your location and pretty much what it does is anybody on that list is yep. it's like recognized for their work with reptiles. So it's not your local vet, you know, you might drive a little bit farther, but if that means your animal's life or death or the quality of the care that animal receives, it's just going to be that much more better from somebody with more experience focused on reptiles and amphibians, for sure. uh, which I think is awesome because like, I mean, living in um, Illinois, Northwest suburbs, I've got a uh, Dr. Steve Barton who is, awesome he's he's helped yeah i know that's i I had it super easy but it's like i mean and it's yeah i've paid a lot of money for some vet visits but it's money well spent and i'm happy to say that i still have a lot of my animals here with me because of him so well even even with a rev uh in in other podcast endeavors i've been fortunate enough to interview some folks that uh were really heavily involved in that organization and the the one veterinarian we got to talking with him and like even he would tell you like you you got to tell me what's going on like he he's a he was a reptile nerd 
he he had kept some different species as pets and things and and you know went to clinics and that's really what arav tells you about your veterinarian is that when they do continuing education or or have opportunities for other classes and stuff they choose to do them in reptiles and exotics and, and things like that so they have a little bit more experience but like you know that dude even even for him was like hey you got to tell me what it is specifically you know there's how many species of even like mark o'shea just came out with the book of snakes right that's like thicker than my leg so when you show up and you hand this snake to the vet and and it's always going to be one of us that has some weird stupid thing that we found in egypt or whatever like they're not going to know and it and he's not an idiot because he doesn't know the one sailfin thing you discovered and like that's not his fault you know what i mean like you're a nerd help him out <laughs> you know like i've never understood it so now that we're done yelling about vets um we are at like an hour and 40 so where can people find the two of you other than reptiles magazine alex you can go first um yeah i'm pretty much on everything uh alex is a gomids right now i primarily work with chinese water dragons i've bred them three years in a row and like uh, they're pretty much my best equivalent of a mini sailfin sailfins are what got me into water dragons but you can find me on instagram facebook twitter uh, there's an Alex is a Gomez Discord community and then the Alex is a Gomez YouTube channel where I geek out about water dragons and I also like to review reptile products. And I am not that savvy on social media. You can message me on Instagram and Facebook. I may or may not get back to you, but if you email me, I will get back to you. Um, but yeah, I'm, I don't have a whole lot of social media right now. Okay, very cool. I will tag the different social media pages and stuff on the Facebook page, and then I will put them in the show notes so that folks can find them uh, so that everybody knows where to find everybody. This was awesome. I'm, I'm super glad the two of you came on. Um, I'm, I'm just really jealous of you. I, I, I grew up with reptiles magazines. I thought that was so cool. Uh, so congratulations to the two of you. I think that's a, a big accomplishment. Thank and, you. Um, I know you also were doing stuff for her Petaculture magazine. Those guys are trying to be cool. So congratulations on that too, I guess. No, I love their magazine. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, I I talked to Justin, of course, about all the different show stuff, and, and he helps me out with doing all the stuff on the network. And I, I told him I was talking to the two of you, and, and he brought up the same thing. He was like, oh, it's going to be awesome, you know, and – so they were very excited as well. So, yeah, I'm glad the two of you came on. It's, it was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so for much. having us. Yeah. It was fun. Yes, Justin, I was talking about you and your <laughs> comments in the chat section. Okay. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Later. Okay. That was episode 21. That was awesome. I'm so glad they came on. Uh, I, I was totally serious. I was super jealous when I saw the article. And of course, it was on sale fins, which are amazing. And they, they were both right, you know, in that they're kind of an underrated species, but also a bucket list species, which is a weird space to be in uh, for an animal. But that's definitely kind of the space it occupies right now. I, it's for sure a bucket list species for me. And yet also something where I, I hardly ever see it. And then you only ever see imports. And like, there's a lot of weird conundrums with that whole group of lizards and Alex is super well versed in it. Uh, definitely check him out for the Chinese water dragons. Uh, I love watching his stuff with that. He's been really successful with it. And then this is my first time talking to Casey also super cool, obviously has a really cool collection. You should um, hit up social media on that end. I, I know she said that she's not too savvy with it, but she has a lot of really cool stuff that you can check out. Um, yeah, it, it was great. So 
we are at like an hour and 45. We had a ton of folks in the chat, I assume, because Alex and Casey were already very popular with Reptiles Magazine, which is pretty exciting. So, <laughs> so we will see you in another two weeks. Later. <laughs>